So hello everyone, uh, my name is Karina Urquhart and I'm the Executive Director at BIC and your host for this session. It's great to see that we have a, a small but perfectly formed uh, group of you tuning into this BIC event today, which is on the subject of sales and inventory reporting for the 21st century. We'll be tweeting about this event using the hashtag BIC brunch, so please feel free to join in the conversation online. So just a few things, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Some of you will be familiar with this already because um, I recognize quite a few names from previous Big Brunch sessions. Um, but we just ask you to um, stay on mute uh, so that uh, we can make sure that the background uh, noise is, is as reduced as it can possibly be because this event is being recorded. Um, and if you have a question to ask our speakers, um, please do make a note of the question and either put it in the comments um, or the chat box um, or, or wait till the end of the uh, session where we'll have a, 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 ten, a 10 minute Q&A section. So for those of you who haven't been to a big brunch before, what are they? So there are a series of short live online events that focus on a particular book industry supply chain topic or issue with industry expert speakers. They're all recorded and shared to our YouTube platform, the link for which is on the screen now at the bottom of the screen there. More information about all of our up and coming or upcoming BIC Brunch and also Green BIC Brunch sessions can be found on our website via the links shown on the screen. We'll be sharing the slides later on on our website. So if you don't get a chance to make a note of the links, um, I appreciate they're quite long. Uh, don't worry, you, you, you get the slides uh, later on. So here's the agenda or the, the, the running order for today. Um, you'll see we have three speakers lined up for you. Graham Bell, Executive Director Editor, Simon Pallant, Digital and IT Services Manager at Gardeners, and John Bell, Publishing Systems Manager at HarperCollins Publishers. As I've already said, there's a, there's a 10 minute uh, time slot allocated at the end of this event for questions, um, but do post any questions in, in the chat box as we go along. So, BIC, who are we? For those of you who don't already know, BIC is a UK-based not-for-profit members organisation at the heart of the book industry, creating standards, best practices and resources, forming part of the DNA of your supply chains, helping your organisations become more efficient, save money, become less wasteful and hopefully ultimately greener. At the cornerstone of the book industry, we hold a unique position of trust, facilitating UK and international industry-wide collaboration to reach agreement on dependable standards and best practice in the supply chain. Amongst many other activities and initiatives, we publish a series of short informative papers, currently 19 of them, on a variety of industry standards and best practices, and these are known as BIC Bytes. Given the topic of today's event, I thought I'd share with you all the link to the BIC Byte on Editex, um, the standard which we will be talking about today. So, what does or should sales or could sales and inventory reporting for the 21st century look like? Well, it, it should enable organisations to quickly and efficiently establish if your retailers and or distributors have successfully received your ebook, for example. It should save you time and resource by enabling a move away from myriad different sales reporting formats and all the subsequent complications and effort that they bring. And it should also mean that you're able to quickly communicate availability and sales information along the supply chain without having to dedicate valuable time and resource to the task. Editex is the industry standard that can help enable these things. So today's session will provide an overview of Editex sales and inventory reporting messages, an explanation of their uses within and benefits to organisations in the book industry supply chain. We're going to hear about the benefits of automating the sales and inventory reporting for both print and ebooks and gain insight into our speakers' findings and experiences during their recent collaborative Editex pilot. So 
with that in mind, I'll now pass you over to Graham Bell, Executive Director, Editor. Graham is going to talk about uh, Editex, he's going to introduce it, explain what it is, what it's all about, talk about its history um, as well, and, and give some examples on the screen. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Graham. Thank you very much, Karina. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this big brunch. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. So uh, I guess the first uh, slide poses the question, what is Editex? Uh, but I'll actually preface it with a couple of uh, comments about who is Editor. Uh, so I work for an organization called Editor. We work very closely with BIC, with BISG, uh, with BookNet Canada, uh, with many other similar organizations around the world. We're best known for uh, developing, supporting, promoting the Onyx standard, and more recently, the Thema standard for subject categorization. But as well as Onyx and Thema, we also look after Editex. So Editex is a family of standards. It's not a single standard. Thema is a single standard. Onyx is a small family, but Editex is a relatively large family of XML-based business messages. They're XML, like Onyx, uh, but they don't use the same tags or anything like that. They have some commonality but they're fundamentally a different family of standards. Editex is mostly a family of what we call transactional messages. That's things like orders and invoices, goods received notes, dispatch notes, perhaps returns authorization queries, that sort of thing. They're business to business only, of course, and they're about ordering, invoicing, paying for, um, and moving goods around within the supply chain. They can apply to physical or digital products. And many of them can actually be embedded inside another standard, a big standard called BIC Realtime. Some of the BIC Realtime messages are actually based around Editex messages inside a BIC Realtime wrapper. Not all of them are like that. And BIC Realtime has some other messages as well, which are not derived from Editex. But within the Editex family, there are two messages that are actually not transactional. They're reporting messages. And those are the two we're talking about today. The first one is the Editex inventory report. And the second one, the Editex sales report. They're both most relevant to digital products. Although the inventory report could be used for reporting physical inventory that may be subject to potential return, or that is on consignment or something like that. Digital inventory is an odd concept, but what we mean by that is a report that highlights technical issues. It's not how many copies of an ebook, because of course, extra copies of ebooks can be created on demand by the retail platforms, but it's about do you have the master files for this ebook? Do you have the necessary metadata for this ebook? and so on. And the sales report. One thing that's worth saying about the sales report is that it can cover B2B sales or B2C sales, and it includes the reporting of things like sales tax, which needs separate reporting in North America. Next slide, please. All these Editex reports are originally designed to be sent from a retailer or a retail platform to a publisher. Listing sales of physical goods, listing manufactured on demand physical goods, or listing those digital products. And as Karina said in the introduction, these messages need to be standardized because of course there are many, many, many retailers and retail platforms reporting sales back to publishers Publishers are receiving sales reports from many, many outlets. And if each of those sales reports has a unique format, then it's difficult and expensive to collate them and to input them into the publisher's uh, business intelligence systems. You need to know about the sales as a publisher for obvious reasons, but it's much better 
if you're told about the sales in a consistent manner. If every sales report is a unique spreadsheet or you have to go to the retailer's sales reporting portal uh, in order to download some bespoke report format, it's manual and it's expensive. Next slide, please. So the sales and sales tax report in Editex is designed to be that standardized sales report. Like many of our standards, it's based around XML, but there is also a flat file version. And what do I mean by flat file? I mean something that you can create from a spreadsheet. It's tables and columns, rows and columns rather. They can be reported as an Excel spreadsheet or as a comma separated file. Now that flat file version, uh, which is based on our XML version and promoted by the book industry study group in New York, has some good things about it, but it also has some limitations. It's actually based on the Editex sales report as it was a decade ago. Since then, there've been a couple of updates. The XML version was enhanced most recently uh, towards the end of 2018. Those enhancements consisted of some changes to give a little more commonality with Onyx. Things like field names, code lists, and so on were made a little bit more Onyx-like in order to improve people's understanding of what Editex was. And we also added into Editex many of the things that we've added into Onyx over the last decade. In particular, pricing has become much more sophisticated. So there were things that you could say in Onyx about a price that you could not report on. We fixed that. So everything you can now say in Onyx about a price can be reported on in Editex. Now, to be uh, honest about it, there are very few implementations of the latest XML version of the sales and sales tax report. Whilst we did all those additions, not that many people have implemented it yet. There's a large number using the flat file or the slightly older XML version. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is the specification as it is now. The latest version is version 1.2. Next slide. Thank you. Within that specification, it's kind of like the Onyx spec, very carefully written. But in addition, we've got these little flowchart like diagrams that help you to understand the structure of the XML. So you'll see there, for example, you can read item detail. If you could go back one slide, please. Thank you. Item detail there in the middle of that three element structure is optional. Sorry, it's not optional, it's mandatory because you have to go through it to get from the beginning to the end of the diagram. But it's also repeatable. So it's a mandatory and repeatable field because the arrow shows you can loop back and go through that field again. Next slide. On the previous slide, we had header, item detail, and a trailer. That's the three part structure that's actually present in almost every edit text message. This is the item detail layer that's repeatable each product. And uh, you can see there are numerous fields that allow you to report the sales for each product, the tax for each product, the price that it was sold at, and so on. Next slide, please. That sales and sales tax report uh, allows you to First of all, consolidate the sales of all the products and then deliver it in a standardized format to the publisher. And ideally the publisher would be getting that format from every retail outlet or every outlet that's doing um, print on demand, manufacturing on demand, where again, sales need to be reported. The other side of sales is inventory. Uh, this is the second uh, report we'll talk about today. Now, this goes back to about a decade ago, 2009. Again, designed for goods on consignment and for retailer print on demand programs. It's worth noting there's no flat file version of this. This is an XML only version. 
Plus revised again in 2018 to incorporate a new option. Um, we added the concept of digital inventory. And um, this is because of the effort, the time, the expense that publishers have been expending on ascertaining whether their products are on sale or not. The publisher distributes the master files for an ebook, but then has to get somebody to look at all the individual ebook retailer websites to see whether that particular product has gone on sale. This is a massive waste of time. Much better if each retailer could report, yeah, we've got your master file, it's exactly as we want it, it's on sale. Not reporting the sale, but reporting the fact that that product is on sale. Or reporting back to the publisher that they've discovered some problem. Maybe the master file is corrupt. Maybe they're still waiting for the metadata. So whilst publishers were resorting to scraping retailer websites, there can now be a simple standardized report. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is the specification as it is now. Um, the latest version is from two years ago. And uh, next slide, please. It's documented in much the same way. Um, not so surprising that you see the same structure of header, item detail and summary or trailer that you get for every, more or less every XML message in the Editex family. Next slide, please. Here's the structure for item detail and you'll see you can identify the item, you can um, give its inventory quantity. How many copies have you got in stock? That's the lower left side of the diagram there. The inventory quantity is intended for physical stock. But the right lower side of the diagram is the bit we added in 2018 for digital inventory. And here we can see inventory status. That gives us a way of saying, yes, this product is fine or no, this product is not fine. Um, next slide, please. So concentrating on that digital side, because that's the new bit. Next slide. The inventory status takes one of these codes, many, many, many codes, about 70 of them. Uh, but you can say things like uh, the retailer can say, yes, we have the metadata and we have the master file. It's not actually gone on sale yet, but maybe we're waiting for the sales embargo. That would be uh, code 15, I think. Um, you can say the metadata is ready, the master file is fine, there's no problems, it's on sale. That's probably one of the codes off the bottom of the screen. But you can report back towards the publisher on the exact status of each item in your digital inventory, saying what is the problem, why hasn't it gone on sale, or there are no problems, it is on sale. The codes can be supplemented by inventory notes as well, if you want to give further details of what the problem is. Next slide, please. I think that's about all I want to say, but we have two other speakers who will take up this story now and uh, describe how this digital inventory reporting has been implemented. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, I think it's important to, to re-emphasise the point you made about the commonality with Onyx um, and how important that is, especially with given today's sophistications around pricing and um, digital sales, etc. Um, and also that you can communicate the exact status of inventory for, for digital as well, I think is it's, it's the potential for that in terms of cost savings, time savings, etc. Is, is, is huge um, as well. So, um, so yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation and for your time today. Um, so next up, then we have uh, Simon Pallant, Digital and IT Services Manager at Gardeners. Um, Simon, as Graham says, Simon is going to uh, tell us about Gardeners' experience of Editex via the, the pilot and why 
why they're involved, why they got involved in the pilot, what benefits they have witnessed so far. Um, and I believe, Simon, you're, you're going to talk about both the inventory reporting perspective and also the sales reporting perspective. So over to you, Simon. OK, thank, thank you, Karina. And hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, yes, yes I'm Simon. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> So I'm Simon Pallant, I'm the Digital and IT Services Manager for Gardeners um, and I'm going to be sort of going through some of the benefits that we've encountered in terms of um, both the Editex digital inventory and also sales reporting. Uh, next slide please. Now I'm going to focus slightly more on the sales reporting side of things but um, as I'm keen to have a quick look at uh, the uh, inventory reporting side of things. So next slide, please. Now, for many, um, the um, purpose of an inventory report is, is, is quite functional. Um, and for most, it's, it's, as you heard, it's just really about is the title uh, available um, for sale, yes or no. But each partner uh, within the supply chain has its own um, particular perspectives um, and particular uh, needs. Um, for us, you know, we've got a catalogue of 2.8 million digital titles and the key element for us is really about um, a catalogue and title audit um, with each of the publishers and distributors that we work with. Equally, and um, with our vendors, it's about understanding um, the range of titles that they have available. Um, of key importance for us are things like uh, pricing, uh, channel availability, license types, and in particular, license parameters. Um, and this gets uh, very important when it comes to some of the academic license types that we um, go on to offer. It's very functional in terms of, um, it's about um, finding faults and fixing them. Um, is that missing metadata, ebooks, or covers? Um, it's not necessarily just about missing elements, it's also potentially about faulty elements as well. For other partners we're working with, it's, um, it's more about the discoverability um, of their uh, particular parts of the catalogue um, and ensuring that um, they've maximised uh, market coverage um, through us and, and the vendors that we work with. Now, when it comes to downstream from us, things get slightly more complicated. And some of the considerations we have to bear in mind are that we're dealing with potentially niche vendors. So vendors that are um, focusing on specific genres. Um, they may have technical limitations in terms of the formats that they will um, accept, EPUB, PDF, or maybe MP3s. They will um, potentially have sensitivity regarding the content um, that is available and they will also be making commercial choices as to um, the product ranges that are offered on their sites. And so as a result, not everything um, um, is um, um, available um, through retailers that we offer uh, from our catalogue or indeed that a publisher will um, have available through their catalogues. And this needs to be expressed somehow. So next slide, please. So a quick look at a rather simplistic diagram of the uh, digital supply chain. Uh, no particular surprise on, on the one side, you have the creators and the publishers of digital content. And over on the other side, you've got the vendors. And in between, um, there are uh, often distributors and also um, uh, wholesalers, aggregators, um, and third parties such as ourselves uh, in that mix as well. At its simplest, um, a vendor may have a relationship with one or more publishers and equally a publisher with one or more vendors. But generally, it's a far more complicated supply chain than that. Um, and for us, you know, we're representing potentially 65,000 publishers. We're dealing with 1,400 plus sources of that content. Um, we have 300 plus vendors, which includes in itself uh, at least three other aggregators in the mix. Now, 
that's a very complicated um, and potentially um, um, a complex uh, arrangement of uh, messaging that's going on, especially when you then bear in mind that some of those vendors themselves in that diagram are also aggregators. And so there's a layer further on from this as well. Next slide, please. Now for us, um, we receive and indeed uh, we provide um, inventory reports at the moment. Um, uh, mostly um, they sort of uh, appear in this sort of order. Um, uh, spreadsheets are most common. Uh, delimited, delimited files um, are um, you know, CSV files, tab delimited files and so on, uh, tag files and XML. And obviously this will vary uh, from vendor to vendor. Um, supplier to supplier and publisher to publisher um, and uh, both in format but also content depending on um, ultimately a publisher's individual needs. Uh, next slide please. But the good news is there is indeed um, a standard for this, Editex inventory reporting and I provided a, um, a, a bit of a snippet uh, example there from it and as Graham was saying uh, saying earlier, it does share um, some commonality with, with Onyx, so it looks um, um, pleasingly familiar. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, um, as Graham was saying, there is uh, a very comprehensive um, code list uh, of definitions for uh, the status of a product. Um, I don't, having had a read through, it's difficult to find any uh, examples that are not catered for. Um, so someone spent an awful lot of time working through this. Um, but in addition to uh, the actual status of a product, there's also other uh, important key information uh, in, uh, being described here as well. So titles, contributors, and formats. Now, obviously, um, this is a fantastic way of expressing um, uh, inventory for, um, uh, certainly for us in, in our huge range of titles um, and it's also a very easy standard way of describing it as well um, so you know on face value one file uh, replaces potentially uh, hundreds of other um, slight variations uh, next slide please so I now want to have a quick look at um, uh, Editex sales reporting so next slide please so what's the purpose of a sales report? Well, obviously, everyone wants to get paid, so obvious. Um, but there's a lot of detail involved in these uh, sales reports. Um, there's the prices for a starter. Um, generally, things up start with a, a starting price. There's also a selling price, and there's a lot going on in between. In some cases, we need uh, sales tax information. And there's also the description of uh, the license uh, type being sold. And for us, uh, that covers retail, retail, retail agency, public library, and academic. And within academic, we have uh, multi-user licenses, we have credit-based licenses, rentals, pay-per-views, chapter views, and, and so on. So yeah, the list goes on. So being able to describe those in an effective manner um, is key. And in good old spreadsheet form, that becomes quite a complicated uh, process. In addition to, um, uh, to pricing and uh, license types, we've also then got the complication of currencies, currencies and also territories. Each of these will also have potentially their own price points as well. Going on, we then have promos. And so, you know, these could be promotions um, that specific publishers have with specific vendors. Um, they could be specific to a country or maybe even a territory. We have vendors with very specific uh, commercials and revenue plans. Um, and these as well need to be described in order, in order for the maths to then work out within the, um, the sales reports. We also got a need for other information. Um, things maybe like um, used consumer IDs um, that relate to perhaps agency sales. So with all of this in mind, and next slide please, Karina. Let's have another quick reminder of that uh, supply chain. 
um, we have potentially um, a different or slightly different sales report going on with each and every party um, within the supply chain. And remember, this is just a simplistic view. Next slide, please, Claire. So what's involved in uh, doing this? So every new partner that we talk to, and I'm sure you do, um, there's an onboarding process or a handshaking process. We go about discussing the file format um, that's going to be provided. So again, more often than not, that's going to be uh, a spreadsheet. Um, and then within that, there's a whole conversation of describing the, uh, the, the inherent limitations and um, also capabilities of spreadsheets. So trying to ensure that um, there aren't merged cells or um, that the columns or column headers aren't changing on a, on a monthly basis. Um, quite often, um, we receive some very impressive looking um, spreadsheets that um, with uh, all very colorful, um, with um, uh, analytics and all sorts of other things involved in them. Um, and a conversation needs to be had in order to be able to turn this into a standard feed in order for us to be able to automate the processing of them. Not an easy task. We also have delimited uh, flat files as well, again, CSV and um, uh, tab delimited files, potentially tag and also XML. Another huge area of complexity is you've then got a whole conversation regarding um, agreeing the definitions of any free text that's involved in these. Um, also other code translations that are going on. These will relate to things like different license types, revenue plans, um, and even promotional activity. In doing this, um, I've kind of estimated that on average for each uh, new partner that we take on, we probably spend about five working days uh, as a company um, on each um, um, onboarding process. So that's my time, uh, predominantly our development team's time, um, the support team's time. And going on from that, we then have the ongoing maintenance of them. Um, spreadsheets in particular um, are generally designed uh, with humans in mind. Um, and um, um, even where we have agreed specific formats, quite often uh, there is a human involved at the vendor's side of things in terms of actually uh, manipulating the source data that they have into a format that we've agreed uh, with that vendor. It's a very time consuming, cost effective, and also uh, vulnerable to change uh, process um, from beginning to end. So next slide please. So again, um, good news. Um, there is a standard for this as well, Editech sales reporting. And even better, um, as the snippets um, I provided um, illustrates, it does actually cater for every conceivable variable um, that I've been able to throw at it. Um, and again, it has a familiar and friendly uh, appearance to, um, to Onyx as well, and, and there are commonalities between the two. It's extremely flexible, um, caters for all of the license types, price types, and delivery options that we um, as an um, aggregator offer um, and report back. But most importantly, it's evolving with the industry. Um, so digital products have uh, a range of benefits to them. Um, there are many new um, license types and commercial options being discussed at any given time. And most of those can be catered for within the standard. So next slide, please. So looking at um, some of the individual components, um, as I mentioned, there are comprehensive code lists for most of the elements described within um, a typical sales report. Um, one of the key ones is um, the uh, type of license sold or in uh, um, Onyx term, or in, sorry, in uh, Editex terms, EPUB to usage type. Um, so it tends to determine the type of sale um, that's being uh, carried out. So most retail sales are within zero, zero for no constraints. 
public library with an 06 and so on. Next slide, please. We have a comprehensive list of types of sale that are going on as well. So again, this is the EPUB usage status, and we have a range of options there, everything from retail to retail agency, wholesale, um, and so on. Although um, it may not have been the original purpose for the field, um, another particularly useful one for me is the EPUB usage status, which actually goes on to describe the DRM status of a, uh, of a product. It's of growing interest to us because we have uh, an increasing number of publishers that um, are now offering different price points for particular channels based on the DRM or not associated with that particular product. So there may well be one price point for uh, an Adobe DRM diversion of um, um, that book and another price point for a DRM free version or indeed social watermarking or digital watermarking as it is here. Next slide, please. Again, price types, and these are shared with um, Onyx, as you can see, which is fantastic because it means that we can report back um, the pricing um, as it was described to us within the Onyx we received from the publisher back to them within the form of um, the, the sales reports that we're providing. So I mentioned that this was uh, a flexible um, format and a, a flexible standard. It currently caters for all of our um, current needs and certainly for some of those that are still on the drawing boards at the moment. But one of the important things about this standard and believe me, as, as someone um, who also manages data flows from non-book related industries, we are very fortunate to have these standards available. Uh, some of these other industries are a bit of a wild west when it comes to um, providing um, this sort of messaging. So next slide, please. So I, uh, as all of you will do, uh, attend book fairs and um, take part in video calls um, um, with uh, uh, new partners and vendors. And there is always um, you know, the question, how do you supply your metadata? It's a straightforward question. And 99 times out of 100, it has a very straightforward answer, Onyx, full stop. With that one word, a whole conversation has been replaced, a whole process has been replaced, and apart from perhaps a little bit of discussion about the frequency of uh, delivery of um, uh, Onyx data, um, everything else has been catered for in that one word. Even someone new to the industry um, um, is won over very quickly when they realize that once they've built an Onyx engine, um, they can then deal with anyone else that's in the exhibition hall or indeed um, uh, anyone that is. Next slide, please. So wouldn't it be good to be able to do the same with inventory and also sales reports for digital products? So. I mentioned we would go through an entire onboarding process, potentially five days uh, work uh, in order to uh, see that through from beginning to end. Yes, there's a little bit of development work involved in setting that up at the outset, but for most, it's fairly minor. Um, that data already exists within your systems. It's just a case of adjusting the format and then standardizing that. The benefits are, A, None of that time spent in uh, discussing the uh, uh, often unnecessary details of spreadsheets and so on. Um, and having done it, it's entirely transportable. So you only need to do it at once. If you're a vendor, that means one implementation means you deal with the entire industry. And equally for publishers and parties such as ourselves, we can then integrate with uh, both sides of um, the supply chain as well. Saving time, money, and most importantly, then actually getting onto the important conversations of how do we actually sell more books, which is ultimately what we're all trying to do. And with that, last slide, please. Thank you. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, every I've seen you present a few times, and every time you do, I'm always <laughs> I'm always blown away by the sheer number of. Um, organizations that uh, Gardner's trades with, so 65,000 plus publishers. 
and all the other ones. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, hearing hearing from you that your onboarding process on average takes about five days. If if you could eliminate that, or at least you know reduce that down to half a day or one day, that that's that's got to be a good thing, um, not not just for gardeners but but for everybody. Um, and also the, I'm always the the question of using spreadsheets, um, the potential for error there on a repeatable ongoing basis is is pretty high I would imagine and, and probably something that a, a lot of organizations have to um, come to grips with and, and, and spend lots of time and resource and money etc um, resolving when you know as you very clearly say that the, the answer to to resolving those issues is is editex certainly for sales and inventory reporting anyway um, so thank you very much so next up we have John Bell, Publishing Systems Manager, HarperCollins Publishers, and John's going to talk to us um, about the industry pilot for Editext, um, and as a result of that participation, what Editext is actually like in practice. Um, and I think as well, uh, John, you're going to talk briefly about lessons learned along the way. So over to you, John. Yes, thank you, Corinna. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so as, as Corinna introduced, we, HarperCollins, have done a small pilot using Editex inventory reporting, not the sales reporting, but the inventory reporting with Gardeners and WF House. Next slide, please. The, the aim, you know, it, it's obvious from the previous two talks, the aim here is to reduce reliance on proprietary reports. I'm, I'm sure any other publishers on the call will be familiar with the, the different emails you get from retail platforms. Those, I think, are Kobo, Apple and Amazon. And you, you get something different from each platform. Kobo, quite good. They send you a zip with a spreadsheet in it and the spreadsheet is fairly standardised. The, the other two on, on the screen are just a table in an email that's quite hard to, to do anything useful with and certainly not um, possible to automatically process. And I guess one, one other thing that's worth saying about these reports, they're only ever, or at least for us anyway, they're only ever reports about the forthcoming books that retailers are looking for. So, our, you know, the next month's publications, they're not a way of producing uh, or delivering a full inventory report. What do we have on sale today? That that just isn't isn't a thing that retailers send us. So we, we have various different formats and they don't actually answer the question that we want. Is the, is the full catalog on sale where it should be. Next slide, please. Um, the scope of this pilot is very simple. We, we had two, two partners, House and Gardeners. Um, both, both of those are a similar place in the supply chain. They're wholesalers rather than end, end retailers. Our relationship with them is very similar. Um, HarperCollins supply them with digital assets in, in both cases, both ebooks and audiobooks. Um, and in both cases, we send the Monix 3 messages. Um, metadata about those products and the pilot here was to get back Editex inventory reporting from from those wholesalers so that we could see have we sent you the files you wanted have we sent you the metadata you wanted uh, next slide please Karina and um, yeah less lessons learned Simon and Graham have both talked about the the detail available in the Editex inventory status um, report Graham I think you said there were 70 something possible codes uh, I, I'm not terribly interested in most of them as a publisher. Uh, some of them deal with what's going on inside the uh, in, inside the wholesaler system. So your master file is in QA. I'm, I'm not very interested in that as a as a publisher. Um, but but obviously, if I'm building a parsing engine to read edit text, I need to to be able to do something with every code, even if I'm not very interested in in that code. So I've, I've highlighted just for amusement the, the sort of subset that we're really interested in here. Um, there is no metadata and there are no master files. That's clearly, clearly a critical failure. There's no metadata, but we do have master files. That's not going to work either. We've got metadata and we have master files as well. You know, the, 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 the fundamental things that we're trying to get back are, are pretty simple. There's, there's lots of nuance that's possible. What was interesting in the trial is that the, the codes that Gardeners and Howes sent back were different subsets of the full set of possibilities. So we, we had to, you know, not, not only think about parsing codes that we actually don't care about, but parse, parse different codes from different people. And, you know, Simon talked about the, 
the five days onboarding process that that sounds terrifying and actually as Karina said any time I listen to Simon I always feel that my my problems as a publisher are very very small scale we've got 40,000 ebooks not 2.8 million it, it, it's a different world of problem but um, the, the 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 there is still a piece of interpretation even though editex is a standard there's still a piece of interpretation where I have to know what WF house mean when they send me a particular code and I have to, to know is that what gardeners mean when they send me a similar code or a different code um, that, that's a challenge it's not you know it, it's inevitable but it's a challenge so it's not it, it wasn't quite as easy to, to just receive an edit text message and know what to do with it as we, we had anticipated that it would be uh, next slide please Karina continuation of that really there's a fundamental thing that that we tripped up over quite early on Editex inventory talks about master files and it talks about metadata and I don't know which one the cover is is that part of your marketing metadata so if if my wholesaler says I've got your master files but your metadata is broken could that mean they don't have the cover or is the cover actually one of the master files and if they say I've got all the metadata but the master files are missing could that mean they're missing the cover that so that again it's a sort of an interpretation question it's a standard but you, you've got to be clear you, you may have to have a conversation with your vendor or your, your Edisex inventory report supplier to determine exactly what do they mean if they say we're missing a master file which kind of master file could it be next slide please Karina and the, the other thing that that was interesting to me um, despite there being 70 odd different inventory codes that cover lots of nuance that isn't interesting to me there are still points where we got a message back from one of our pilot partners and and the editex standard message didn't tell us what we needed to know so this, this is a sample from a wf Howes message where they sent us back a industry status of 75 the product isn't fulfilling there are no known issues but we are not accepting orders that that matters to me the book is not on sale i think it should be and it isn't why given that there are no known issues why why is not clear from the editex inventory status code it's only clear because WF House went the extra mile and put into the inventory note some free text explaining what was wrong. There are no prices in your Onyx. So they had the metadata, they had the master files, all of them covers and contents, um, but couldn't sell the book because we didn't tell them how much it should cost. Obviously that's, that's not a, a fault of the Editex standard. The that, you know, Editex is about the inventory, but in order to fix the problem that WF House had with this book, I, I need some extra information that couldn't easily be passed from the edit text message that that's you know, again not a fault with the standard but it, it's an issue that we came across quite early next slide please Karina thanks and um, a thing that Simon you know Simon's diagram touched on already um, the, the digital supply chain is quite complicated we, we actually you know, we supply to core source who are a file distributor they supply our files to gardeners so we don't actually send epubs or wav files directly to gardeners there's already an intermediary there we supply from core source directly to some customers but we also supply via gardeners and sometimes you know gardeners are supplying a, a retailer that's custom facing sometimes as simon said they're supplying another aggregator or another wholesaler like libri in europe who then supply to the trade retailer at the end of the chain it, it's quite complicated and you know our our pilot was only about gardeners or wf house in in the red circle but what what publishers are really interested in you know, i'm i'm different because i'm in the supply chain world but what publishers themselves are interested in is is my book on sale to the consumer at the end of the chain so those boxes in green are much more interesting to my business than the boxes in black or the box in red is my book on sale at aldi life matters more than do gardeners have my book in order to send it to Aldi Life as far as my business is concerned, at least until something goes wrong. So we, we although the, the pilot was a little bit challenging and interesting, it doesn't actually take us as far as we wanted to go um, to, to deliver that business. Is my book on sale at Apple today kind of solution. Next slide, please, Karina. Um, so a, a recap on just just on the scope of the the pilot it it's publisher to wholesaler and back to publisher next slide please what what we'd really like is something a little bit more like this where the 
retailers that the intermediaries like gardeners deal with are sending data back ideally for Simon's benefit ideally using Editex and end retailers who face consumers are sending data back to the wholesaler and the date the wholesaler is passing that B to C data back to the publisher because that's what my my business really wants to know is does the retailer have the book on sale right now um, Editex could support that the, the, the data is all there but it, it will be messy in terms of workflow Obviously, a retailer, you know, B2C retailer wouldn't want to tell me, HarperCollins, about Penguin Random House books. So if, if we were going with a model like this, either the retailer would need to be doing some filtering so that their Editex inventory report back to gardeners only included HarperCollins books so that gardeners could pass that back to me with only HarperCollins books in it, or the retailer sends their whole catalogue to gardeners and Simon has to filter it so that I only get news about the HarperCollins books. It, it's kind of messy and I, I frankly don't really want to receive multiple Editex inventory reports via anybody. I'd, I'd rather some kind of clever aggregation happened. Um, if you could go to the next slide please, Karina. So an ideal solution for a, a publisher like us that deals with lots of intermediaries, lots of retailers and, and a big catalogue. We, you know, we have 40,000 ebooks. It's tiny compared to Simon's, but it's still a lot of books to worry about. What, what will be ideal for us is if the retailers in the green boxes could supply data back to gardeners or to house or any other you know, intermediary that we deal with um, alongside an on its acknowledgement to deal with that. Well, your book isn't on sale because you didn't tell us how much to charge for it kind of problem. The Editex inventory won't cover that, but the, the acknowledgement message could. Um, that goes back to gardeners and it would be great for us if th those intermediaries like gardeners could aggregate everything back together into one message back to the publisher, not, not, you know, not, not one message per retailer, but one message per um, wholesaler and tell us here's the status of your books at all of the people that we deal with. Currently, Editex doesn't support that kind of aggregation, um, but it would be great if it did. And that obviously on its acknowledgement, I know that some retailers are starting to use on its acknowledgement to say, we got your metadata, but there's something wrong with it. If, if that could be passed back through the intermediaries back to the publisher as well, that, that would be a fantastic um, virtuous circle. Next slide, please, Karina. And just wanted to end with two quotes from my, my two co-speakers here. Um, I love Simon's quote. He, he gave it to me actually for, for a similar presentation I did at Frankfurt. Editex, sweet. It, it's true. It's a great standard to, to solve a problem that we all have. Um, and Graham gave me a quote that actually uh, uh, confirms that final diagram that actually if, if you as a publisher use the Onyx strict XSD to confirm that your Onyx message is, is you know, meets the standard, your retailer or your intermediary sends you back an acknowledgement saying yeah we got it we inter interpreted it properly it's all good and the person at the end of the chain can say yes and we got all the master files that went with your successfully delivered metadata that that works perfectly um, we'd, we'd love to go there and you know, everything that everybody else has said about the sales reporting is also true HarperCollins have had in a an addendum to our ebook retailer contracts for I think six years or maybe seven and please send us sales reports in Editex XML. We've yet to have a single Editex XML sales report. And we, we do, as you know, Graham said, employ somebody to take those multiple different sales reporting spreadsheets and turn them into something standardized. So we, we'd love a better Editex flavored world. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, um, John. Uh, I was quite, yeah, interesting. Your, your your observations there about the importance of interpretation. Um, I think that's very interesting and interesting as well that you got different subsets back from the two pilot partners as well. Um, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, is that something that you think could be addressed by the standard or do you think, you know, as a, a sort of an interpretation guide or is that more of a, a B2B conversation? I think it's it's a B two B conversation. Yeah. The the covers question could be clarified in the standard. Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, we, we should all just agree the cover is part of the metadata, or agree the cover is part of the uh, master files. Doesn't matter which. You know, yeah. They're both equally important. Um, but the the rest of it is a B two B conversation, and that that's true of Onyx as well. You know, I think Simon touched on that. If if you say send us some Onyx, it it there is always a little bit of um, communication around oh, but 
which library price do you want us to use or you know yeah. something like that so there, there will always be um b2b conversation or, or you know simon to retailer conversation yeah. i think yeah <laughs> okay brilliant thank you um so um john you you you've touched there on um the sort of further potential for, for edit texts and you, you talked about the aggregation of inventory reporting you know one message per wholesaler back to the publisher because it's you know it's it's the products that are on sale that the the publisher is interested in um so i'm going to call on graham again um just to talk to us about where next for edit text and what does the future hold so over to you graham uh thanks karina so the pilot uh, is, is an interesting example of how do standards evolve? The standards always have to evolve to meet changing business problems in the supply chain. So all of our standards, editor standards are under constant revision. If the business problem changes or different parts of the business problem become more important over time, then the standard needs to evolve as well. It needs to evolve in a highly compatible way. Um, just going back to that point about interpretation, um, I think John's right in saying that the standard could do more to make it clear whether the cover is part of the content or part of the metadata, or it could simply say, actually, there's three things, not just content and metadata files, but content files, metadata files, and covers. Now, in fact, that 70 odd codes that we've mentioned several times includes the possibility for including extra codes to do with the cover um, they're actually at the moment only about 35 or 40 codes in that list that's been shown and uh, one of the codes that was shown was 75 and i'm struggling with the interpretation of that 75 means there's no known issues except for the issue that you haven't got any prices to me, that's an issue. And actually, I'd have recommended to use a different code other than 75. John's, Indeed, third, yes. John's third point was about um, aggregation. Yes, they can get the data they want back from gardeners, from Simon, but what they want more than anything else is the data that Simon gets from the retail outlets. And the current structure of Editex, which is circled in pink here, is really only suitable for one set of inventory statuses, the ones from gardeners. Next slide, please. Thank you, Karina. So um, this could, in the near future, be developed to include a little more. We see inventory status and inventory note here at the top of the right-hand diagram, but then we see a new little section, and note it's optional, if you follow the blue line so it's compatible with what we've got and it's also repeatable because this little new section from sales outlet through inventory status to inventory note would allow simon to report back to gardener sorry from gardeners to harper collins the inventory statuses of all the retail platforms they deal with so looking at the right hand diagram, the top two fields would be what Gardner says about the status of the files that they have. And then the bottom three would name a particular sales outlet and what that sales outlet says about the inventory status. And of course, if you're dealing with 100 retail sales outlets, there may be 100 repeats of that sales outlet and the following two fields. This is a great example of how standards evolve over time to meet new or emerging or more important business requirements. Now, we haven't updated Editex yet, but this illustrates the way that it likely will be updated uh, relatively soon. Thank you very much. Karina. Oh, sorry, I was on mute, <laughs> talking to myself. Um, 
so yeah just I was just saying thank you Graham and I was just saying how encouraging it was um, that you know that as with with, with all editor standards that um, you know that there's the, the potential for growth and future development as well depending on industry needs etc so we, we are actually out of time but I, I have got a couple of questions that have come through so for those of you who aren't um, pushed for time um, if it's okay, we'll, we'll carry on. If my speakers are okay for time as well, um, just for another five minutes or so, just to, to ask a couple of questions. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. So I've had a question in, um, what are the main barriers to uptake? It's The standard's been around for a while now, um, but it doesn't seem to have achieved critical mass yet um, in the way that Onyx has. How do we get past those barriers? So who wants to go? Who wants to take that one first? I'll say a couple of words, but others may want to chime in. I, I think it's it's fairly clear from some of Simon's comments that the technical issues are not particular barriers for uh, the digital distributors, and uh, maybe even for the digital retailers. Maybe not a technical question. I think there is an issue around awareness. Many, many people are very aware of Onyx and what it can do for the industry. I think many fewer people are aware of Editex. In terms of the inventory report, we also have to remember um, that for digital inventory, it's only really two years old. This work was done in 2018. And we find even with new additions to Onyx, it takes maybe a couple of years for people to start implementing those new additions. They generally don't. If they get added to Onyx in year X. It's usually year X plus one before we even get questions about those new additions. And year X plus two, when we start to hear about people implementing those additions. So there is a certain lag time and I understand that. Uh, John or Simon, did you want to add anything? I, I can add a little bit from a publisher's perspective. We um, Maybe this is this is no, this is true. We would flat out refuse to to supply metadata to a new ebook or or indeed digital audiobook vendor in any format other than Onyx. We just wouldn't do it. If they said we'd prefer to get it in a spreadsheet, we, we wouldn't do that. We we maybe maybe point them in the direction of somebody like Gardens or or Ingram who who might fulfil that for them. But we as a publisher certainly wouldn't contemplate sending anything other than Onyx. We we are currently willing to take any sales report we get because as Simon said we, we want to get paid so we, we don't have that that kind of clout to say actually if you can't report in Editex we're not gonna, we're not going to deal with you that that's not available to us yet and and the inventory reporting we, we don't really do that as Graham said we, we used to when we had a, a smaller ebook catalog we used to pay somebody at HarperCollins to go to websites and check are all the ebooks up this week um, now that we've got, you know, a very much bigger catalogue, that just isn't practical at all. Um, so, so we again, we we can't, we're not in a position yet to say to people, if you can't report the inventory to us in Editex, we're not going to deal with you. That it, it just, I, mean, I suppose maybe that's self-fulfilling, but, but that's how it feels right now. We can say no, we won't send you a spreadsheet instead of Onyx, but we we have to say yes, we will take your your bespoke spreadsheet instead of Editex. It's about what people call cost to serve, isn't it? Mm. At the moment, dealing with multiple spreadsheets is more expensive to serve that uh, retailer. Uh, but at some point, that more expensive because they're dealing with Excel spreadsheets uh, becomes much less acceptable. Yeah. Simon, I don't know if you wanted to say anything to that point. Yeah, I did. Yeah, both Graham and John have sort of really covered it the, yeah. the um yeah there, there is a um a hurdle to overcoming or a leap of faith um with um with a lot in terms of just getting the development work done um based on the fact there are relatively few participants able to exchange those at the moment but um with with pressure from um from, from all the right places um you know it can be put in place quite easily as a standard. Um, and indeed, we're applying the pressure we can to those we work with. Um, but it really takes the industry just to, to have a look at this as a whole. 
Yeah, and on that on that sort of on that point, um, well, for an extension of that question, I guess is if there's someone on this um, session today who thinks this is a really good idea, I want. I want to, you know, I want my organisation to, to look at using this. Where, where would you say the best place for for an organisation to start might be? To Graham, initially. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would probably recommend anybody who's interested in in edtex, either inventory reporting or sales reporting, to simply look at the specifications. Mm. Um, they're freely available from the editor website. As I think it was Simon said, all this data exists because people are reporting this data. Mm. They're just reporting it in a way that's not terribly convenient for anybody. Yeah. And all you know, they're all choosing unique ways of reporting. So the data exists. There is a matter of formatting it into the proper XML report format. And that's what the spreadsheet, sorry, that's what the specification will tell you. Um, the documentation is relatively clear. It's not perfect by any means, but it's reasonably good. And anybody used to the documentation for Onyx will be definitely used to our style. So look at the specifications, uh, give it to your technical partners to um, have a look at as well. Um, I'd certainly think about that. And then I'd think about talking to supply chain partners either upstream or downstream to see whether they would be interested in doing a sort of bipartite uh, introduction hmm. of edit text and, and, and maybe get buy-in from from key departments internally as well um, depending on the structure of your organization i would say you might want to talk to your sales teams or your uh, oper certainly your operational teams um, and get a get your head head around the, the benefits I think as well to to each of those those areas um, it's actually more than anything else you want to talk to your finance team because yeah. it's the cost of doing things manually yeah. um, that you need to focus on and that cost of doing things manually can be offset against the cost of any software development you need to do yeah exactly um, okay oh we have another question would it be possible to create a free mapping tool to convert retailer sales data to edit text format well somebody could do it in theory <laughs> but, uh, you know that's that's quite a lot of development work yeah. for somebody to do and i don't think people are going to do that in a big way free of charge yeah not yet anyway at least but I, I guess it's that that's a you know in a way maybe maybe Simon is best a place to answer this. But there will be people in the supply chain who may be doing that for their own purposes internally, or doing something similar. You know, building for each each bespoke sales report they get back from a retailer, building something to turn it into a standard thing that they could then report back to somebody else using editor you know I don't, I don't know whether gardens are doing that or um, you know for inventory maybe courses do something like that to, you know build build a bunch of bespoke mappings to suit themselves where the end result is edit x definitely possible that that's happening somewhere yeah i mean in in some respects i mean that the um in in terms of how we um um will phase this in is that you know we have mechanisms for uh, translating the inbound sales reports and also the outbound and so um, you know we, we can implement uh, vendors and publishers individually um, in terms of pointing it uh, a utility at a uh, a file and converting that to, to edit text that, that, that's that's uh, there's a bit more to that um, possibly than um, um, I can think of at the moment <laughs> hi guys this is Ruth from Ingram um, hi Ruth Hi. Yeah, it's interesting you raise that. We are planning to launch a service that does exactly that um, in terms of sales reporting, normalizing it um, in Q1. Um, and the reason that everyone had a deep intake of breath is, yeah, you're right, we have been doing this for a while, but doing the mapping and managing the changes that sometimes happen um, from retailers is, is not a small amount of work, but um, certainly um, happy to let the group know when we're ready uh, for people to 
have a play with at all. And no, it won't be free, by the way. Thanks, Ruth. Um, OK, I think given the time, we should probably draw this to a close. It's 10 past one now. So um, I would just like to quickly wrap up and just summarise, if I may, that the the Editex standard, as we've seen, um, can go a long way to removing the headache and the cost um, and inefficiencies around um, the current inventory and sales reporting for many organisations within the supply chain. Um, we've heard how there's a potential for future development and evolution of the of the standard, um, particularly when it comes to aggregating data from from um, from from uh, retailers to publishers, whether that's via um, wholesaler or, or another third party. Um, technical issues are not an issue. Um, it's more a question of encouraging take up. So we need as an industry um, and, and particularly I guess big editor, etc. The the standards bodies and the the supply chain bodies need to um, sort of promote awareness um, a lot more about about this standard, and reach out to our stakeholders, to our to our membership, etc. And and maybe hold more of, of these types of events um, as well to to encourage take up um, and. I think as well, it's encouraging that, uh, Graham, I think you said that the inventory reporting is only two years old. Um, and as we know, with any standard um, adoption uh, can take considerable time, um, particularly as well when we look at the um, the, the move from Onyx 2.1 to Onyx 3. So um, I, I don't think we should be discouraged. Um, and I think we should we should keep keep on spreading the word about edit text because it, it clearly is a is a standard that, that can help with so many issues. Um, so on that note, uh, I would like to take this opportunity then to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers on behalf of everyone attending today. Um, thank you, Graham, Simon and John for taking the time to present to all of us and to you, our attendees. I'd like to say thank you for joining. Please do stay in touch. Uh, you can find out more about uh, BIC and the work we do on our website um, and if you want to stay in touch uh, with with our events etc have a think about joining one of our mailing lists the links there on the screen and we'll make this presentation slideshow for this event available on our website shortly and a recording of this uh, webinar will be posted to the BIC YouTube channel very soon um, so Thank you for attending and we hope to see you at the next BIC brunch, which will be on the 4th of February next year on the topic of streamlining returns, saving time and costs, which is what BIC is all about, saving time and costs. Um, so hope to see you at another BIC event in the very near future, but take care of yourselves until then. Thank you. <laughs>